So there I was as an eight-year-old boy with a hammer trying to pull nails out of these dilapidated pieces of wood. I was helping my grandfather tear down a shed. He wanted to put a new one where it sat. And what job do you give the eight-year-old boy? You give him a hammer and he starts pulling nails out of these boards. Well, I started to notice something particular. He was taking these nails. They were broken and bent and rusty. And he was putting them in a little metal can. And I was like, he has plenty of nails. In fact, he has metal cans everywhere full of nails. I asked my father later, I said, why was grandpa saving all of these nails? Without skipping a beat, my father said, oh, well, he was a product of the Great Depression. And somehow, even at eight years old, I knew what that meant. You see, there was a generation that had gone through an experience and it changed how they thought and then it changed how they acted. And we just covered it with a blanket of grace, a simple phrase, and we all understood. So I'm a millennial. I, I know I'm a millennial because I took one of those little quizzes on Facebook. I came out 70% millennial. I was like, okay, I'll take it. But I've also traveled now almost 800,000 miles extensively across New York State and across 46 states of America and now stacking up the international countries. And I have just as many locations on my bucket list now. So that's the other way you would know I was millennial. Our generation also went through a very unique set of circumstances and years that changed how we thought and therefore how we acted. The good news is the millennials finally get to save the day this time because the change in our travel habits are how we're going to stabilize communities into the future. And perhaps right now is the greatest opportunity for rural communities to leverage a growing visitor economy and the realities of what that means to call young professionals back after college and have growing families and thought leaders in rural communities that have suffered the loss of residents for years. You see, traditionally, travel happened in two buckets. You had the family trip and the retirees traveling. And I remember the family trip. We'd pack into the minivan and head for the shore. Tom Baudet said he'd leave the light on for us, and he did. But we had to wait until we retired to see the world. You see, there was a mantra that was taught to us. And it was repeated so often, it became how our brains thought. Do as well as you can in high school. Go as far as you can in college. And then get into a good company with good benefits, good retirement. And you put your head down and you push and you push and you work. And you buy a house and you buy two cars and you have 2.3 kids on average. So we said, okay, and we, we started into this because one day when we retire, we're going to get to travel the world. But I was, I was 16. I remember exactly where I was standing on that day in September when the world stopped turning. And suddenly fear and terror and war became a part of our lexicon. And at that moment, trauma became a part of our life. We just didn't really know it. And they said, don't worry, it's a once-in-a-lifetime event. So, okay, so we soldiered on to this mantra. Seven years later, not long enough to be a once-in-a-lifetime event. I don't know exactly what happened, but I think a stern bear collapsed on Wall Street. Or maybe it was a bear stern, I don't know. But what, by the time they were done mopping it up, the world had changed again. And now we were watching even more dramatically people fall to the bottom of balance sheets and just be gone. 17-year careers, 20-year careers ended. Entire retirement accounts wiped out. Houses going underwater. Now can we afford those two, kid, two cars, also the 2.3 kids? It was a difficult time. You see, Generation X had already walked through that door. The door was closing. The millennials stepped back and said, wait. We're not waiting to retire to travel the world. We're grappling with a higher level of anxiety that any generation has wrestled with. We want experiences, not things. We're going to put off buying a house. We'll need one eventually. We've got to have somewhere to put all of our participation trophies. But 
We're going to pause. We're going to go see the world and travel we did. The millennial generation started traveling more than any generation in history. Three, four, five times a year we were traveling from 18 to 30. No generation had ever traveled that much. And they said, well, it's a little quirky how they travel. They sleep on air mattresses in people's third bedroom for $30. We gave birth to the shared economy. But those were our rusty and broken nails that we were collecting. It was a mark of a different era we had lived through and a different way we were thinking. We needed to see the world now. We needed to have experiences. We went into nature. Hiking, day hikes, biking trails, all these different amenities started to become normal. And we started to up level and or up influence and down influence into the other generations. Now Generation X started traveling a lot more. And Generation Z just thought this was normal. Everybody travels all the time. That gave birth to a completely new travel industry because as we traveled, as anyone travels, visitors begin to build amenities and communities. We, we kind of, as millennials, we liked our espresso drinks and we favored destinations that had espresso drinks. We liked guac. We know it's extra. Who doesn't love a taco bar? We liked yoga. Now there's a thing called hot yoga. All yoga for me in two minutes is hot yoga. I'm sitting there pouring. Somebody in the back is like, is somebody cooking bacon? I was like, sorry, sorry. It's me sweating. But you see, as these amenities started to grow, millennials are looking around because as we started families, we started to look, where do we want to settle? Wouldn't it make sense that we started to settle in places that had been enjoyable to visit. And there comes the grand thesis. If you have a destination that young people enjoy visiting, you have a destination that young people will want to live in. And the reverse is also true. If young people don't want to visit your town, you probably don't have a town that young people will stay in after college. That's a threat. This is what the visitor economy, the new reality was being birthed. And I work in the destination marketing and management industry. So I teach destinations how to use the visitor economy to stabilize that resident population, to make it an enjoyable place. We can simply use the visitor as the investor, the visitor as the catalyst to build the assets. It's, it's a magnificent opportunity. Maura Gast from Destinations International, she's the former chair, and she had the brilliant way of putting it when she said, if you build a place that people want to visit, you are building a place where people are going to want to live. And if you are building a place where people want to live, now you're building a place where businesses have to be. And if you build a place where businesses have to be, now you're building a place that people want to visit. It becomes a cycle. It starts with a visitor. It's only that complicated. It starts with a visitor. And they build the quality of place, the quality of life that we then want to live around. So we fixed it. Done. Love it. Or so I thought. Coming outside of the pandemic, we thought, oh, for Sure, we're never going to have to defend travel again. People couldn't travel for 18 years or 18 months. Felt like 18 years. 18 months. Right after the pandemic, I was at an event and a person came up to me and they said, have you heard what's happened in Goshen, New York? It's so sad. And I was like, no, I haven't heard what's happened in Goshen, New York. They said, oh, you have to hear what happened in Goshen, New York. It's so sad. And I'm like, I'm an empath. Like, what happened in Goshen, New York? And they said, they built a Legoland. <laughs> this is where I start to turn into Liam Neeson. I have a particular set of skills. Skills that make me a nightmare for a person like you. Because I knew what they were saying. I already knew how the conversation was going to unfold. And it did. Too many visitors. Too much traffic. We don't need visitors in our town. I want them gone. The restaurants are full. There's two problems here that I have to unpack. Goshen, New York's in the Hudson Valley. 
It's a beautiful historic little town, and they built a Legoland resort there, the third in North America. And it was going to cause change in that community. But change was coming anyway. I could take you to a hundred towns that were beautiful, quiet, historic little towns, and one by one, the shops on Main Street disappear. Then the businesses disappear. Then the restaurants disappear. And next thing you know, you lose your volunteers for civic organizations and for non-for-profits and for theater groups. And then all of a sudden, someone comes through and says, have you seen what's happened in this town? It's so sad. See, I know so many places that are slipping into post-agricultural, slipping into post-industrial communities. What was once working isn't working anymore. And the visitor economy is so portable now. Because post-pandemic, 30 to 40% of the world can work from anywhere. They can work from anywhere. Where are they gonna choose to work? In places that are enjoyable to visit. So I know that we have to manage that traffic. We have to manage that flow. That's what we do in this industry. We have to work with the residents to know how much is too much. But I also know as that conversation went further, I say, hey, where are you traveling? And they said, oh, we're going to this place and we're going off the beaten path where the locals go. We found a pub where all the locals eat. Well, isn't that nice? You go to where the locals are, but you don't want visitors in your town. This is the compromise. This is what we have to work out in the future, is an understanding that we can't chase out the industry that is going to matter for everything we do in the future. We can't chase it out. So in the destination management and marketing industry, what we do is strike a unique brand for a destination. We find whatever that authentic thing that they have is, and we make it their brand, and we invite visitors. And then we manage to spread them out across the destination and spread them out across the calendar, across the seasons. We start to see how much is too much, how many visitors are too many visitors. Because if your favorite restaurant is full, that's not a lack of success in our world. Because you have that restaurant the rest of the year because the visitors fuel it so intensely two months a year. So we know that we have to have dialogue. More and more our industry is turning into destination stewardship where we look at all of these factors and we work with residents to measure and figure out how is this going to work but it has to work because we can't have our young people go to college and never come back. I want to live in a destination where my children can be gainfully employed. Maybe my daughter is going to go manage Legoland. Maybe my son is going to drive the propane truck that delivers to all the new restaurants that exploded after that park was built. Maybe the contractor standing on top of the Short-term rental, changing the roof, is in the visitor economy the day that they're working on that roof. Because the visitor economy is beyond just tourism jobs. They're beyond just frontline jobs. They're all of the ancillary industries that have to rise up when an economy is flourishing. And we watch and we manage those factors as well. Because it's going to be the difference if your children walk up the block for Thanksgiving or if you have to all talk about flights. It's going to be the difference of whether cousins are going to school together. If we invite visitors and we manage it, they will stabilize us into the future. And I used to start with this, and now I feel more and more like I'm ending with this. I start now talking about the economics. But remember the social side of this. One of my favorite quotes from Mark Twain, actually my second favorite quote from Mark Twain, my favorite quote from Mark Twain is, don't believe every quote you read on the internet. Mark Twain. <laughs> my second favorite Mark Twain quote is that travel proves deadly to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. We need, yes, we need to travel. We need to see other parts of the world. We need to learn from other cultures and other people. And then we need to invite them into our destination so they can do the same. Travel has exposed me to more than I ever thought it would. 
And right now, we have the opportunity to use it as a tool to stabilize our communities. And rural America, this is your moment because people want fresh air, clean water, spaced out living, smaller school sizes, lower crime. It's on a platter. You have it. Building visitor assets will cause more people to want to live in your destination. And now we could have a growth in residents in rural places. And really what I believe is that tourists might just save your town. I have been Josiah Brown. Thank you so much for your time.